We're going to go ahead and get started. If you would turn in your hymnals to page 305, we're going to sing Praise Him, Praise Him. Page 305, we're going to stand and sing Praise Him, Praise Him. You open up to wear a prayer, please. Father, thank you for bringing us together today. Amen. All right, let's turn over to page 231. We're going to sing Follow On, page 231. Page 231, follow on. Oh, 
let's sing one more. Turn it over to page 223. Page 223. Draw me nearer. Page 223, draw me nearer. All right, so uh, just have some thoughts here about Jesus Christ, uh, full of grace and truth. I thought this was a real interesting little study, uh, and I wanted to share it with you guys. I hope it was hope it'll be a blessing to you. Um, <clears throat> t 
Turn over to Psalm chapter 86, and that's this is where we're going to start. Psalm chapter 86. Psalm chapter 86. <clears throat> Sound of babies in the church means that we're not a dying church. There's new life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so even if it's crying, <laughs> it's still new life. It's a blessing. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 86. <laughs> even if it's very frustrated crying. <laughs> Get on point here. Psalm chapter 86, verse 15. Sure. Psalm chapter 86, verse 15. The Bible says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long suffering, plenteous in mercy and truth. Let's open in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you put your blessing upon this message, Lord. I pray that it, it speaks to our hearts. I pray that you just reveal to us something special out of your word. Uh, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, uh, this verse here just kind of outlines a bunch of different attributes of God. And uh, I guess what I want to point out, sort of to start off with, is there's this, there's this phenomenal balance in the attributes of God. All right. And so, so he's, uh, he's, he's righteous, he's just, uh, but he's, he's, still got, he's still full of grace and mercy. Okay, he uh, he's able to he's able to extend grace without violating some other aspect of hi of him, like his justice, for instance. Uh, God is a righteous judge, and he 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 judges righteously, and so so he uh, he measures out exactly what is due. Okay, um, but. But he's able to do that while also still dispensing grace and mercy in a way that, that they don't conflict with one another. And this is, this is a really phenomenal, phenomenal thought. So God is described as being just and full of grace, uh, um, righteous, but still, uh, but still good and tender-hearted. <clears throat> tender-hearted. Uh, and, and merciful. And there's a bunch of other verses along these lines. Uh, in Exodus, we'll not turn there, but Exodus 33, verse 19, the Bible says, And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious upon whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. God is gracious. He's full of mercy, compassion, but he's also just and righteous. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 9, describes God as being gracious and merciful. Uh, Hebrews, or sorry, Nehemiah 9, 17, describes God as being uh, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. Yet, he's a righteous, just God. He judges righteously. These things uh, are kind of hard to balance, or at least, it, uh, but somehow, but God does it perfectly. All right? <clears throat> Psalm 103, verse 8, the Bible says, well, let's go there. Psalm 103, verse 8, we're real close to that verse. <clears throat> There's many, many, many verses in the Old Testament that are relevant to this. Um, so I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a, highlight some specific verses that seemed especially relevant. Psalm 103, <clears throat> Verse, um, verse 8, and there the Bible says, The Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. God is a just God. Let's look at this other verse here, Isaiah 45, 21. This one's really, uh, really good. Isaiah 45, 21. Just bear with me. I just, we're, we're, gonna, we're hitting a couple of verses here to kind of lay the groundwork. For the, for the message, <clears throat> Isaiah 45, 
and verse 21. The Bible says there, uh, Tell ye, and bring them near, let them take counsel together, who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Those two things uh, are kind of, they're not contradictory, but they're kind of hard, uh, almost opposing. God is just. To, to, to be just means you're upright, honest, conforming exactly to the laws, equitable in distribution of justice. That means someone who does wrong gets judged like someone who has done wrong. You know? And, and that's what it means to be a just God. That means the distribution of justice is equal and fair. But then at the same time, it says he's a savior. And we know that Savior, God as our Savior, represents a, an outpouring of grace and mercy and love. Where he takes uh, sinners who deserve to be judged as sinners and instead pours out grace, unmerited love and favor, goodwill, undue mercy, unmerited pardon. God is tender-hearted, um, but also holy in all of his ways, slow to anger, uh, of great mercy, but still righteous uh, and just. And there's a balance here. <clears throat> and uh, to sort of to focus on on two of them, and, and I think you probably could, could find a message in, in uh, a lot of different balancing aspects, but I want to focus on two of them. He is full of grace and truth, okay? And I think you can kind of encompass his justice, his righteousness in his truth because in his truth he defines right and wrong and he meets them out uh, exactly as they're due because of his justice. And uh, um, But then also he's full of grace and, and, and as part of that definition of grace is... Um, is, uh, is Pour, is the uh, you know pouring out mercy, and so mercy and grace are just kind of wrapped right up together. You can't really separate the two. Uh, two. Two nouns that describe God used to describe God that bear out these two attributes: His grace and His truth. Is God is love in First John chapter four, and God is light in John chapter one. I think. I forget where that one's at. Um, <clears throat> God is light. Uh, uh, light uh, is, uh, relates to truth. And God is love. And that love is, relates to his grace. So you can kind of see the parallel there. Um, illustrated differently uh, in Psalm 84. Let's, let's look at that. Psalm 84. This is an interesting verse. <clears throat> <clears throat> Psalm 84 and uh, verse 11. Psalm 84, verse 11, the Bible says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So God is described as a sun and a shield. You can see the same thing there. A light sun shield maps to his love, his grace. <clears throat> uh, so those two qualities of God are demonstrated in the works of Jesus Christ. And this is kind of where I want to focus on it. Focus, focus in on, for the message, turn to John chapter 1. <clears throat> John chapter 1. And here is where he, Jesus Christ is described as the light. John chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, this is the verse I actually want to go to, not the light verse. But John chapter 1, verse 14, describing Jesus Christ. 
Look at what it says. It says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And there's that parallel. And so let's look at the life of Jesus Christ and, and how He dispenses grace and truth. All right, so just follow with me. We're going to go to a couple of these different examples here. And then I have a few thoughts to kind of to kind of wrap it up. Um, okay, so examples of Jesus Christ dispensing grace and truth. The first one I've got is the man at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. Let's turn over there. John chapter 5. And I'll read the whole passage here. It's the first 14 verses of John chapter 5. The Bible says, And this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. <coughs> now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked, and on the, and, and on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then they asked him, What man is this that said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he, and he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee here in this in this story you've got this man he's been uh, in uh, he's been uh, he's been uh, he's had this problem for this infirmity for 38 years and God goes up uh, Jesus Christ there comes up to him and sees the state that he's in and dispenses grace and he and says rise take up thy bed and walk but then, God being uh, perfectly balanced, he comes back, meets up with the man later, and says, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come, to come unto thee. So in truth, God told, uh, Jesus Christ said, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come come to thee. In grace he said, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And he healed him. And in, in, in truth he said, okay, now go sin no more. <clears throat> All right, let me show you another one. <clears throat> uh, John chapter 8. <clears throat> John chapter 8, and uh, starting in verse 1, we'll read down through verse 11. This is the, the woman that was taken in adultery. Bible says there in verse 1, John chapter 8, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again unto the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? <clears throat> uh, John chapter 8, verse 6. 
This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued, uh, when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast when them first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Uh, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman. Where are these, those are thine accusers? That hath um, no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. So here you've got this woman that was taken in adultery. She was caught in the very act. And she was about to get stoned. According to the law of Moses, she was to be stoned. And um, Jesus Christ comes into that, that scene there. And he begins... He begins uh, he begins writing on the ground with his finger. Of course, we don't we don't really know what he wrote, um, uh, but uh, but and then a afterwards, he uh, he lifted up himself and he said he said you know whoever's without sin cast the first stone. You know some people I've heard said and um, you know then maybe he was writing down some of the sins of the people that were gathered around. I've heard different things there, but. Um, but uh, but he came there and he said, Who, whoever's without sin among you cast the first stone. And slowly and steadily, everyone left. And then at the very end of it all, she stood there and there was nobody left. And Jesus Christ said, you know, where are your accusers? And she's like, um, none. No man, Lord. So then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. In truth, Jesus Christ said to the multitude, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And in his grace, he said to the woman, Neither do I condemn thee. She was undeserving of mercy, but God, but Christ there uh, dispensed grace. He said, In truth, at the very end, go and sin no more. And so you can see there the balance of grace and truth <clears throat> in this story. <clears throat> All right, let me show you another one here. <clears throat> this is the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew chapter 15. That's a pretty hard word to spell if you're trying to write that down. <laughs> Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15. <clears throat> and verse 21. <clears throat> Matthew 15, verse 21. We'll read down through verse 28. A fair amount of reading in this, but I think it's worthwhile looking at these, making sure we can see the whole story. Matthew 15, verse 21. The Bible says, Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. Uh, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And your daughter was made whole from that very hour. Man. Here, uh, this woman, she was a Gentile. <clears throat> she, was, she was a Gentile. And God and Jesus Christ here, he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was there for the Israelites, not for the Gentiles, not for the Canaanites. 
She was a, a woman of Canaan. He wasn't there for them. He was there for Israel. Just Israel. And uh, truth in truth, Jesus Christ said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. That's what he said. The Gentiles were only offered to salvation to provoke Israel to jealousy. What a place to be. That's all of us in this room. <laughs> we're only offered salvation to provoke um, the Jews, Israel, to jealousy. Uh, maybe only is a bit strong, but, but that was why he offered us salvation. Of course, we are in, uh, in, in uh, that Abrahamic covenant. You know, all families of the earth shall be blessed in the seed of, of Abraham. So we're, we're fall into that group of all families. <laughs> And all nations in uh, in the other passage is like Genesis 12 and 17 and I think 21 or 23. Um, but uh, so in truth, Jesus Christ said, "It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs." But then, in His grace, after seeing her great faith, He said, "O woman, great is thy faith; be it unto thee even as thou wilt." And there it is, a balanced display of God's grace and his truth. <clears throat> All right, let's do uh, let's, let's do another one here. We've got just a couple more. <clears throat> uh, the nobleman of Capernaum in John chapter 4. <clears throat> John chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 48. John chapter 4, verse 48, down through, I'm sorry, verse 46 through 50. Verse 46 through 50. The Bible says there in verse 46 of John chapter 4, so Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Uh, when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went into him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and went his way. <clears throat> so this man, uh, this man here had a had a son who was sick, and he came to Jesus Christ to get healing. And uh, and Jesus Christ, in truth, he said, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. This man was lacking in faith. And that rebuke seemed to have strengthened his faith, uh, it seems, because, um, because then in grace God said, shortly, there, shortly just after that, go thy way, thy son liveth. The man it was in desperation at the response of Jesus Christ when he said in truth that except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. That was the state that that man was in. And... Uh, and uh, out of, uh, I guess, out of the, the desperation in his heart, he, he, it, it just tipped him over that last little bit. His faith increased, and Jesus Christ said, Go thy way, thy son liveth, and he healed his son. And so God there dispensed grace to this man. Um, uh, in truth, he said, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Uh, he was saying, You're lacking in faith. Um, you, you're not going to believe unless you see me do great works. But then, uh, but then in his grace, he said, go thy way, thy son liveth. Despite your unbelief, your son is healed. Go your way. He didn't, his son wasn't there. He didn't see the sign and wonder. He, he, he simply, um, God, uh, despite his unbelief, through, though he was, um, he had, uh, uh, through, through, through his unmerited favor, the nobleman's heart was, was won over. Because look, it says, uh, <clears throat> Uh, let's see. 
And in verse 50, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. <clears throat> so you had this man, he, he didn't have enough faith, and, and God, in truth, pointed that out, but healed, him, healed his son anyway. And the man believed the word. <clears throat> you can see that equal distribution of his truth and his grace. Uh, there's uh, there's other ones. Uh, we're going to kind of jump to the end here. <clears throat> um, uh, just to kind of give you an overview of some of these other ones. You've got Jerusalem in Matthew 23, 37 through 39. In truth, uh, Jesus Christ pronounced its doom. Uh, and in his grace, he wept over it and foretold the day when uh, when they would welcome him back and say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> uh, and But we want to get to this one here, uh, in the gospel message. Uh, his grace and truth in the gospel message. All right, this is one I want to get to because we're kind of getting short on time here. So we'll, uh, John chapter 3 and verse 36. <clears throat> uh, that, that previous one, uh, the Jerusalem was Matthew 23, 37 through 39, if you're taking notes. Um, and uh, this last one, uh, in the gospel message, grace and truth in the gospel message, John three thirty six. <clears throat> John chapter 3, verse 36. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You can see there that in grace, Jesus Christ here says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Unmerited disp uh, dispensation of grace there. Uh, had nothing to do with the merits of the sinner that believes, but simply that he believes, God then gives him grace and everlasting life. And then in truth, he says, He that believeth on the Son, or no, sorry, He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him he's saying there you deserve hell and i offered you life and righteousness but you refuse so now the wrath of god abides on you in this verse we've got the gospel uh the gospel dispensed out in grace and truth if you believe on the son you'll have everlasting life if you do not believe on the son you're going to perish for all eternity in in hell and I think uh, uh, the, the key concept here that I, wanna, that I think all of this kind of points to, that at least for me the most meaningful, meaningful aspect of this, is, is Jesus Christ, he never showed grace at the expense of truth. He never showed grace at the expense of truth. We serve a God who dispenses grace, which is unmerited favor, but he never does it at the expense of truth. He never does it at the expense of truth. <clears throat> he never does it at the expense of his... Uh, he, he dispenses mercy, but never does it at the expense of his righteousness. He never violates his justice when he outpours his grace upon mankind. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You might wonder... How in the world did God satisfy his justice in the gospel message? Well, he, he satisfies his, his, his justice by offering, offering us a substitute. He offered us a substitute. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, the Bible says, For he, God the Father, hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God, in truth, declared that, that, that sin must be paid for. You can see that in, uh, in uh, the curse there in Genesis chapter 3, where God lays out the curse for Adam and Eve after they had sinned. Uh, sin had to be paid for, and God, in his grace, he offered free salvation, but he didn't do it without compromising his justice or without compromising his righteousness because what he did was he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our substitute so that sin was still paid for in the person of Jesus Christ. And he was able to apply Jesus Christ's righteousness to us. And, and, and with the application of righteousness, he was able to offer us 
life. He was able to, to, to accept us into heaven. <clears throat> and so he was able to balance out these different attributes, his truth and his grace. God's truth um, that sin must be paid for was not compromised. God's justice was fulfilled um, because, of, because of that payment on the cross. <clears throat> he, he applied Jesus Christ that gave us his righteousness and uh, so that God would look down upon us and see a righteous servant. Right? Man, isn't that a good thought? That is good right there. He made us worthy of heaven. <clears throat> he made us worthy of heaven. That was how he was able to dispense grace without compromising on his justice. He made us worthy by offering his son as a substitute. And to kind of uh, bring this back, um, bring this back in application to, to us as Christians, look over at Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2. Uh, I've quoted this verse before, but over in 2 Peter 3.18, the Bible says that we ought to grow in grace. Okay? Um, but here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, <clears throat> the Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. God tells us to grow in grace. God tells us in 1 Peter 4, verse 10, to, uh, uh, to, to, to be good stewards of God's manifold grace. But like Jesus Christ, we should never dispense grace at the expense of truth. That means grace is not an excuse to compromise. It's not an excuse for compromise. God demands holiness from us. The Bible says in uh, 1 Peter 1.16, Be ye holy, for I am holy. <clears throat> so yeah, we ought to show grace. We have an obligation to show grace to others. We have an obligation to show grace to others, uh, um, to help them up. But we should never compromise on truth we should never allow that allow that grace to be disproportioned with the truth in god's word as uh, uh, as it relates to how we ought to live as christians as as, as it relates to how we ought to identify uh, and judge sin grace does not mean ignoring sin god did not ignore our sin when he dispensed grace he offered Jesus Christ as a substitute to pay for the sin. He took care of the sin. And he gave us grace. Those two things have to go together or else you become unbalanced as a Christian. Grace doesn't mean allowing sin to have free reign. It means showing someone favor, goodwill, kindness, free, unmerited love. But in doing so, we need to, we, we need to never compromise on holiness. We still need to deal with the, the sin. We still need to deal with the problems. And we've, it takes a lot of wisdom to, to meet that out appropriately. <clears throat> the Bible says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I, I don't, uh, uh, my intent here is not to de emphasize grace at all, but to make sure grace is balanced appropriately with the truth in God's Word. <clears throat> we can never compromise. We can ne and, and especially we can never compromise using grace as an excuse. <clears throat> they need to be balanced. So we ought to show unmerited love and favor to others, even sinners, especially sinners. But we still need to deal with the sin and how you balance that out, how you... Uh, you know, you're going to have to pray and get some wisdom from God on that. <clears throat> uh, but uh, that is all I have. Hopefully that was a blessing. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, help us to, 
help us to be balanced as Christians, Lord, to, uh, to, to, to distribute grace to others, to be good stewards of, of the manifold grace of God, as it says in 1 Peter 4, verse 10, Lord. But help us not to compromise on truth. Lord, help us to seek you, uh, seek your, your wisdom in the way we dispense uh, truth and grace and live a balanced life like Jesus Christ did in, in, um, when he was on earth, uh, full of grace and truth and his ministry on earth. Lord, help us to have that uh, balance. Help us to strive for that balance. Let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, Lord. I pray that you just help us with that and strengthen us, Lord. Uh, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen.